Yeah, I work for LMFM Radio and it is a very timely session, an interesting session and we've an exceptionally talented panel to discuss the topic which is uh, the radio revolution, new trends in covering politics. It comes on thought of a very decisive election in the United Kingdom for Boris Johnson and uh, the Tories and a, a very indecisive election here as you know. What did we learn from this uh, election? Well, I think one thing that we're being told continuously is uh, that governments aren't re-elected and there's a lot of merit in that and they certainly aren't re-elected twice uh, but that has been the case in the past. Uh, as Fine Gael reminded us, it, it happened once before. And we're lucky enough to have on the panel uh, the woman who was predominantly responsible for communicating the message of uh, that government that won three successive times in the election. She's acted as an advisor to government for almost 15 years, the first woman ever to become the government press secretary, and the youngest person to ever have taken that role. She was a, a key player in Bertie Hearn's back room, an advisor at the Department of the Taoiseach with special responsibility for Northern Ireland affairs, a formidable doctor of spin. Uh, today, she is part of the media. She writes a, a regular column for the Irish Independent. In her spare time, she's the Chief Executive Officer of the Irish Offshore Association, and I hope you'll welcome Mandy Johnson. In radio these days, we all know the importance of digital tools, whether that's the internet, social media, Facebook, live or live streams, and there's many good examples of how radio are, is using these tools these days, uh, but there's one station, I, I think, in particular that's brought this to a whole new level during uh, the last uh, election. I'm not sure if any of you have watched Ocean FM's coverage, uh, but uh, we're lucky enough to have the person behind it with us uh, this morning, because they've really set the bar, I think, for the rest of us who are involved in covering politics. This is a man who has many talents, uh, not just uh, in terms of journalism, music, news, radio, internet, multimedia. Uh, he's not satisfied, uh, apparently, with the success of uh, the Sea Session Surf Music Festival, which is a huge festival. So he's decided upon a, a second festival this year, and good luck to you with uh, the Saltwater Festival, which uh, looks great on paper, at least. Uh, he comes to radio. He's well established in uh, the radio business from a, a newspaper background. He started in the Donegal, Donegal Democrat as a, a journalist. Today he's the commercial director with Ocean FM uh, and I hope you'll welcome Daniel Brown. I suppose when you're in radio it's all about bums on seats and audience delivery and uh, this next man certainly has a lot of bums on seats. Uh, he was part of a, a team uh, that delivered a, a daily audience of two million listeners over seven years delivering news into the Christian O'Connell Breakfast Show. He's a most enviable CV spanning 20 years in journalism, a wealth of knowledge, vast experience in TV, radio and online. He's reported from war-torn countries like Iraq and Kosovo, received uh, reward, uh, an award uh, as part of his work for Sky News uh, for breaking news on the Manchester Arena bombing. He's worked for Sky, Bauer Media, Virgin Radio, Century Radio in Manchester, Radio City in Liverpool. Today he continues his ongoing work training young journalists, which I think is very important to him. And he also leads uh, the digital strategy as managing editor of LBC and LBC News across online, social, mobile and video platforms. Please welcome Andrew Bailey. So we've two stations represented here, such Ocean FM and LBC, and they've been very innovative in the way they've been covering elections. And we're going to see a short video uh, which will show us some of the work they've been doing. The exit poll is showing the Conservatives on 368 seats, a big Conservative majority. Exit polls are usually not so wrong. I think Boris Johnson's Christmas presents have come early, haven't they? It's pandemonium over there, as I understand it. I mean, it is, to quote, coin the phrase, absolute scenes. But it's going to be closer than you might think. And it's his a nervous night ahead for Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. If we sweep round, we can see the first ballot boxes have arrived. The exit poll looks like a terrible evening for Labour. I, I think it's a terrible evening for all those who 
we wanted to protect. And it looks like London, which used to be a very red city, may well come a little bit more blue. Eventually the public will see it. The Labour Party is going to destroy itself. The Labour Party haven't really looked after the North very well. The majority of the country is sick to death of Brexit and believed Boris when he said that it was all going to be over in a couple of weeks. Red car has gone Tory, Lee has gone Tory, Wolverhampton. You can hear the cheering behind me. Uh, it's uh, the first bit of uh, happiness I've seen all night. Boris Johnson's potential seat where he's there. But let's go live to uh, Uxbridge. Boris Johnson, 25,000. I want to thank the people of this country for turning out to vote in a December election. Well, let's first reflect on Boris Johnson's win and speech. They are going to have to govern as a one nation party. The Conservatives have that majority that they needed. Most of the country has gone with the Conservative Party. Thanks everyone who's made this show possible. Thanks to all our guests. Thanks to you for listening all over the world. John, you wanted to make a, a point there, didn't you? Just at the moment now, and we have quite a number of rural boxes in at the moment, and we recap on... Um... where he may not have got the number one, the fact that he called to the house at all. I think from a Fine Gael perspective, we were the party in power. It was, it was our election to lose. He does face a major battle to retain a seat. The Ocean FM are still there. Can I thank Ocean? You have been fantastic. You have brought this count into people's homes and kitchens all across the country and all around the world. As good as yours. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Uh, I, I think it's probably not unusual for local radio stations to bring elections into people's homes and kitchens, Daniel, but uh, this is heralding change, it would seem to me, uh, because I thought you were a local radio station. That looks more like television. I think the, the key skill in, in media is communication. And I think it's the, the skill that we sometimes get wrapped up in just one platform. And, and I would think, as communicators, we've got to be platform agnostic. Uh, our um, business has transformed over the last number of years. We've started a video division, we've started a Facebook management division, we've started graphic design, website construction areas, and they've been hugely instrumental to the growth in, in the financial revenues of the business. But the core skill we've brought to all those platforms is our knowledge as journalists, as communicators, and um, that's generated revenue for us. And that's allowed us reinvest in, in how we, we represent ourselves as a radio station brand. But in taking on a project like that, you're essentially taking on the big boys, uh, the might of RTA and the resource and the personnel that comes with it. Uh, how does a small local radio station pull it off? I think there's three things that are really important in, in, for the success of local media. It's local, local, local. We had uh, an exit poll that was uh, the only exit poll for a particular constituency, we worked with IT Sligo. And so that was for anybody who was interested in, in politics. And, and in Ireland, we have this insatiable appetite. Uh, it, it really meant that we had a hook to get people on right from the outset. They wanted to know what was our exit poll going to say. We got national coverage for having done that exit poll. We got this hook, we got people into it. Then they wanted to see, were we right? As it transpires, we were. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of that will play into the future as well because people will be watching the next Ocean FM exit poll. Yeah, God willing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you've been doing this for years. I was watching videos of you years ago tasting oh wine in Australia <laughs> and <laughs> playing with animals in London. This is the Zoo. problem with YouTube: is yeah. that you can never yeah. kill off these yeah. videos from Absolutely, the early part of yeah. your career. The problem I have here is that uh, my boss is here, and he knows I have the face for radio. <laughs> 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 you, you film everything you do in LBC. Do. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking uh, to Daniel then, if I go back to the late 90s when I first started in radio, and uh, genuinely we were on typewriters and we were editing on, you know, on Revox, and if I'd have 
thought then that I would be involved, and maybe many of the people here on the panel would think the same, in this kind of visualisation that we have now. I just, I just wouldn't have believed it would be possible for commercial radio to produce those kinds of, um, of programmes. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right to say that we film everything. Every Now at LBC, you know, every key interview... Uh, we request, um, you know, a really good quality video interview with. We're in the process of being able to now go on location to film interviews as well as bringing them into our studios. And certainly the concept with the general election was audio is at the heart of everything we do. It's at the core. You know, we're, we're always about having conversations with our listeners. Um, but if we could keep audio at the core but produce a really good visual product which would engage with people on multiple different digital platforms then that was something we wanted to have a crack at and um, you know as you've seen that was the concept that we came up with mm. and all the way through the project we said let's not make bad telly let's make really good visualized radio which sounds a little bit kind of you know, you know corporate but it's absolutely what we set out to do we looked at the things that worked from tv and we also discounted things that we didn't need to do. Mm. And are you growing the audience that you would otherwise target, or are you appealing to people who would otherwise not be interested in what LBC does? It's a bit of both, to be honest. Mm. I think it's a case of, um, you know, we've had record numbers we've delivered. You know, we had a record rage at the end of, uh, of last year, 2.7 million listeners. It's fantastic. You know, we're in good shape with our, with our radio programmes. But there's no doubt at all that there are, there are audience, potential audience members out there and listeners and viewers that we haven't yet connected with and we want to, to take our product to them, whether that's through podcasts, whether that's through video streams, live streaming, or, or our policy that people may have seen, which is of, you know, when you get a great interview, there might be just a really dynamite minute 30 or two minute that you can find and dig out and our journalists can dig out of that interview uh, and chop it and repurpose it for Twitter or for Facebook. And we see massive engagement on those, real shareability around presenters like Nick Ferrari, James O'Brien, uh, and others, Nigel Farage. Mm. Daniel, would you think that you're growing what would be a, a traditionally a, a local radio audience, or are you getting people who wouldn't listen to local radio? Very much so. I mean, we would have, you know, I live in the community I work in. I'm familiar with how people would view the radio station. You know, traditionally, your regional radio station in Ireland might be perceived as a 40 plus medium. Whereas um, people will come to our website because the news is trusted on our, on our website. People will follow us on Facebook because they want to see the updates on road closures, on news, etc. So again, to me, I don't care how we're reaching people. I don't mind if it's via Facebook. If it, I'm not obsessed with the fact that it's all got to be on air. I think you've got to fish where the fish are. And if the fish are in, on, on YouTube, then you've got to be on YouTube. All right, Mandy, what do politicians make of this? So, I mean, politicians, first of all, it's about 20% of their life, you know. There's 80% of their life where they're not thinking about the media, but there's a, there's a structure beneath the politicians with evil people like me, who you call spin doctors, <laughs> who are looking at the landscape of media and seeing what is going to work best for the politicians uh, that they're trying to present. And so, you know, broadcast has always been a big part of that offering, particularly local radio, because it's, it's a medium to get directly to your geographical audience. And it's ironic because as the landscape of media expands and we have more options, so uh, it, it, and there's more avenues available to politicians to tell their story and get their content out and create their own messaging. It's ironic because their own audience is becoming ever more elusive. Uh, and actually local radio and local news is the way that you can actually really target it. But I would see it like this. So when I started in politics, which was in 1994, there were three main avenues to communicate with uh, the electorate or the listeners or the readership. So it's, it's, the, it's the print press, it's the broadcast or TV. Now social media uh, has made that, those three pillars into a sort of like matrix where you can create content for one that can be applied to something else. The key thing I think, uh, and this is where I think maybe politicians in Ireland in particular are falling behind at the moment, is to understand that different mediums require different content and you mm. cannot just do what you did in the past by creating one single campaign that can be applied to your local newspaper and your local radio station. And is it, that something that needs to be adjusted to in this approach? Because it complicates how you communicate your message to some degree, because it's not just 
uh, listening medium. You're also looking at cameras. Uh, if your hair is tossed, uh, that may work against you and that type of thing. Yeah, and it's, it's a similar situation and problem that the media have, actually, because that um, delivery of content and, and proper engagement requires resources. You know, it's very hard to find a woke 22-year-old who's media, social media savvy with enough experience to not create more problems by interacting with people online, you know? So it, it requires an, an investment of time, effort and energy with politicians don't always have. Um, and I think it's something, actually, we could look to this campaign, particularly Sinn Féin, uh, have done really, really well. But I don't think the other political parties have caught up with the notion that there's a broader landscape with the media available to them to interact directly with their, with their, with their voters. Is that how they're communicating or what they're communicating or, or a bit of both, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, you could go into this uh, and look at each of the individual parties, but I won't, I won't, uh, I'll spare you all that because we've already gone through it. Yeah. But if you look at it this way, um, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, as we would have seen, the traditional parties are kind of talking in the establishment way and Sinn Féin are doing what I would call like a Brexit type communication, where they're talking about the emotive side, the vision, the bigger picture. It's a promise of something that is to come. And the others are kind of caught up in the detail a bit more. We spoke earlier outside about how messaging is so important now because the attention pan span is so little. But equally, repetition is important politically. If you're talking to people's emotions and talking about that, emotional engagement and you get them really early and keep repeating it, it stays with you. And I think that that stood to Sinn Féin. And it's something that they didn't only do in the election campaign, they're still doing it. We're in a, a landscape where we're talking about a programme for government now. The two parties are continually talking about being stuck in a process of who they will and won't speak to. Sinn Féin are still talking about hospital beds and homelessness. Yeah, I, I think Sinn Féin probably also educated people and there was several attempts on the internet to educate young people in particular in how to vote and not to give your vote to somebody if you didn't wish to elect them. In other words, not to go all the way down in terms of how you evaluated candidates. Uh, the internet and its influence is something that is of concern Politically, I think across the world, in the UK, Andrew, uh, there's already been a, a lot of concern with Cambridge Analytica and uh, the impact that uh, social media has had on uh, Brexit. For sure, and um, not not only that, you know, j just to the point that Mandy was making, I, I, I think you know you, you would have said if you looked a few years ago at the supporters of the Labour Party, um, the, the sort of momentum um, faction that grew within the party. Um, you know, young, engaged, socially adept uh, young people. And yet, even though they had that core base, it was, you know, an absolute wipeout at the, um, at the general election. And I think social media absolutely played a part in that. And we, we were talking earlier about, perhaps people here will remember one of the techniques during the leadership debates when Boris Johnson was um, on the BBC. And um, the Conservative Party uh, opted to change its Twitter handle from CCHQ to Fact Check UK. So during that really, really key debate, when perhaps people were taking to the timelines because they were engaged in the debate and having a look, um, they were seeing Fact Check UK, which was actually you know, being written by the Conservative Party. Um, and, and actually, we saw, I think, that that was felt to be a, a step too far. And I think there was a big reaction um, from, from the public and also members of their own party, and they had to kind of rein that in. But the importance of getting that right, the, the, the fact that people are aware now about political advertising, mm. um, they want clarity, I think. People want to know who's authoring uh, an article. They want to know who's behind an app that might be providing a fact check service. Uh, and I think we're seeing that more and more, perhaps as well partially down to Google and its desire to have clarity as well. And, you know, if you want to be registered for... Google News, for example, you have to ensure that you're, you know, the owner of your organisation, the byline of the journalist is all is all present. Um, so, so I do think that's an important part of it, and I do think people uh, are asking for clarity post Cambridge. Come back to your work uh, as programme makers, both of you. Tell me a, a little bit about how you approach uh, this new way of covering stories, whether it's politics or elections or, or whatever. Uh, you're moving out of the radio studio, or what we traditionally would have thought to have been the radio studio, and on onto camera and onto people's phones and they can see what's happening. What matters most? Is it what people are saying, 
which would have always been the case with radio, obviously, or is it how it looks? It looks great, by the way. I mean, it, <laughs> my, my, my own view is it's always about the content. Um, you know, we were talking earlier outside, and we are saying, you know, sometimes if you had the choice between slightly shaky video footage mm. and good audio on it, it's the good, you can't do with bad audio. You, you have to have the audio. Um, to me, it's about, you know, kind of attacking all the senses. You know, if people are um, going out, you know, mm. to, to report on something and they just put it on one medium, well, then you're limiting the reach of that story. And as a, as a journalist in a newsroom, you, you know, you want people to read your story. Nobody wants to be on page 72 of their publication. You know, you want to, to get engagement. So the best way to do that now is to make sure that you, you create the content. And then, as Mandy said, you purpose that content for the right platform. What you might put up on Instagram, you might put up an Instagram story heading into the election count now, you know, but then maybe your, your Facebook Live is a more appropriate platform platform for an interview. So it's just knowing how to tell the story and how to use the platforms. Hey, Andrew? I mean, I'd probably go further and I would say LBC is leading Britain's conversation. And as a result of that, the audio and the conversation is absolutely the heart of everything that we do. Everything that we built um, around the general election coverage, everything that, we, we, that we're, we're looking at um, in the coming years is all about having that core audio products right at the center of what we do and whether that's a live radio program whether that's visualizing elements of that program it still comes back to the fantastic interaction that mm. our presenters have with callers and with guests um, whether that's in the studio whether that's down the line um, but it is about the conversation so um, you know we can prod and we can provoke and we can develop on platforms like Twitter and Facebook and we can give people the opportunity uh, to join the debate but the debate will always come from, from audio at its core. Mandy, tell me a little bit more about the content from the other side of the microphone, if you like, uh, because uh, it's always been a, a cat and mouse game, if you like. Uh, and I know that when politicians come in to me and I have a, a long list of questions, uh, they've already got their answers and they may have nothing to do with the questions. Yeah. How do you prepare for that? So, look, as I see it, the media in general and politicians have a symbiotic relationship. They just can't exist without each other, you know. Um, just speaking from my own perspective, uh, very often you're the, you're the sort of necessary evil in the middle. Neither wants to see you really. The politicians don't want to see me coming because they know I've got a question from the media or want them to go on. The media definitely don't want to see me coming because they'd definitely rather be speaking to the politician. So you're in the middle of this and you're trying to kind of bring them together and you're trying to do something for both of them. So first of all, if you're preparing a politician, it's to find the right place to go or to, to agree to do an interview or not to do an interview, whether it's proactive in terms of promoting a policy or whether it's reactive and engaging on a story that's already live. The very first and most fundamental thing is that that politician needs to know their own brief. And that sounds fairly basic, but it isn't always the case. So that's the starting point. The second thing is to surround yourself with people who challenge you, who don't become cheerleading sycophants and get sucked into the whole, we're great and everybody's against us, with the persecution complex that politicians are already invested in heavily. So you have to behave almost like a, a media um, um, outlet and say, let's anticipate the negative questions and put those really difficult questions to the politician. And it's also thinking beyond yourself. So your own brief is fine, but you need to think about what's happening around you. And sometimes politicians and even their own advisors get sucked into their own little world. It's very narcissistic and myopic. And I would always advise a politician, uh, look, what you need to do is, before you go on any program, no matter what it's about, pick up the newspaper of that day, whether it's the, the, uh, the national newspaper, or go on to your own local radio station, see what's live on that, because you have to be alive to what's going on around you. Um, and a, a real bugbear of mine is uh, when a politician, and y y you know it as well as I do, we've all heard it, you know, at, says that horrible line, um, I'm glad you asked me that question, because firstly, they're not, but secondly, they have prepared. Uh, and, and that's the, the horrible bit that people just don't like. It has to seem organic, and the only way it can seem organic is if people actually understand what they're talking about. I always say this to people that I'm preparing for, for radio interviews or TV interviews in particular, is that you can show people that you don't know what you're talking about for five minutes, or you can just tell them really quickly, I don't know the answer to that mm. question. Mm. And it's much better for everybody if you just do that quickly and save us all a lot of 
uh, of agony. And what if you want to talk about something else than what the interviewer is asking? Well, I would say 90% of the time you do want to talk about something else. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to. Mm. And Sinn Féin, again, I keep coming back to them because they're such good communicators. You have to learn some way of pivoting back onto your own narrative. And actually that just comes with understanding your own brief and understanding how that relates to what you actually do want to talk about. And it comes with experience and time and practice, really. But um, as a government representative being interviewed, if the interviewer is asking about huge numbers of people waiting on trolleys, the government representative wants to talk about the great advancement in cancer care. How do you twist that conversation? Well, so um, every government, whether it's in a, a non-election phase or election phase, has what, what is called a message box. It's a core set of uh, communications. So it would be um, on big ticket items like the economy. So you will know what your overarching position is, where the economy is now, where it is going forward. A kind of uh, a few set pieces, a go-to positions that is agreed at an overarching level. And that's where they resort to. That's what they go back to. They go back to that core messaging and narrative that everybody's invested in, that everybody knows, and that they're comfortable in. Um, and it's not great from your perspective, but it is a safe place for politicians to go. And it's not what the audience always want to hear, but it's the safe go back to position that brings you back to what they want to talk about. Can I can just say one thing on that. One of the great things that I think about um, speech radio is, and particularly radio when uh, it's speech radio that will take callers, that I, I'm just thinking of a few moments during the UK general election campaign when, um, when LBC, and I'm sure other, other stations are doing the same thing, were taking callers uh, and sort of you know, brokering between and, and chairing uh, uh, conversations between you know, real people and politicians. And that is where I think the real challenge is for a politician. Because I think they have their techniques and they are trained on how to deal with a particularly combative interview, uh, an interview that's pushing them and is, you know, chipping them along and drilling down on the detail. But when it's your ordinary caller, you know, when it's a, a, a parent who's really concerned about, you know, the educational provision for their child, they're not a trained journalist, they just want answers to that question and they're going to keep asking it and when you don't know the answer, they're going to say, well, why don't you know? Because you're an elected representative, you should know the answer to my question. And that's really powerful when yeah. you hear that. And, and that is, just to go back to what I was talking about earlier, that is the emotional side and that's what gets listeners or voters engaged but could I just say another point on, on our own election here um, something that I noticed um, has crept into politics in the last four or five years um, for radio stations in particular and and also on, on TV as well and some of the podcasts that are happening so the government have created a situation where they will only interact with the journalist on air and there's very little a debate that happens between politicians on a panel uh, where you get to just be the moderator and allow them to argue their points with each other. And what that does is it, is it robs the listener, the voter, of the opportunity to juxtapose these people against each other. And I think from a journalistic point of view, if it were me, I would be worried because it forces the presenter to be the opposition and also to be the government spokesperson at times. So what I found refreshing in the election campaign was for the first time you had people who were ministers and, and, and front bench people uh, together for the first time arguing and the presenter could just sit back and be the objective, impartial observer that I think journalists should be. I, I think there's two types of politics. One is politics, which is how politicians legislate and introduce policies which uh, affect the lives and affect change and so on. The other is pure politics, if you like, where people are playing the game of politics. And Andrew, you're <laughs> working as a journalist for a long time. Do you think you need to hate politics as much as you need to love it if you're to be good at covering it? No, I don't think you need to hate it, no. But the game I, of it. I, th I think you need to... It's fair to say you, you may want to be a little cynical. <laughs> I'll give you a politician's answer on that. But no, I, I just think, I think it's important to... Look, it's always important to try and, uh, and find balance, but that doesn't prevent you from being opinionated and that doesn't prevent you from, from challenging those who are. Um, but, uh, yes, I mean, I think it's right to be 
uh, cynical of the game of politics because it is cat and mouse and you do see it and, and hear it in interviews and um, I actually think you know uh, listeners and members of the public are getting fed up of the game mm. of politics actually now and I do mm. think to your point that that idea of just kind of breaking down the barriers and allowing politicians and uh, you know, ordinary members of the electorate to have conversations. It's getting harder and harder maybe for, for it to happen in, in the traditional way that it would have done in the sort of town hall environment, touring around constituencies. But the, these digital platforms and, and our radio stations are absolutely giving them that opportunity. Um, and I think people want to be able to question politicians directly and allow their, 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 um, the media organisations to facilitate it, but not always to be in there chipping along. It, it, it's a bit of both. Sometimes you want a very experienced interviewer to really skewer a politician that you know is going to be difficult to get past all the barriers. And other times, the best thing you can do is take a sit back. Eddie Mayer on LBC is incredibly good at doing that, of asking questions and then just sitting back and watching what happens when a caller challenges a politician. It's, it's fascinating to listen to. I think in, in Irish politics, it'd be very seldom that you know a politician allows himself to be put into that position where they're just open to the the public and i think that's what why maybe social media is seen as so refreshing in in our you know sort of warm up for the election we did two election debates mm. i mean we had 16 candidates in one constituency um, and and so we did you know two different election debates we split them up and people would come along to the debates. It's kind of the town hall thing, and they, they want to engage, they want to ask questions, and, and I think people are kind of sick of that game of politics, and I think they see social media as a way of circumnavigating that and, and having a direct route to ask Do you ask think your questions. social media coverage influenced the Ocean FM listeners in terms of how they voted? I, I, would, I would kind of hope that we informed them. I would hope that we didn't influence them. Um, we would, and our, our journalistic team, Niall Delaney, the guys in the newsroom, would, be, would bring the same journalistic standards that they would have on air to the, what they would do online. And it's funny, we were discussing this outside previously, that you know, there's, there's the traditional media standards uh, when they're applied across the new platforms, et cetera, can engender trust and mm. can engender some very positive um, connotations about your brand. Uh, I conversely saw a, a digital media outlet, I won't embarrass them by saying who they are, um, and I saw their kind of guide to the elections in terms of how do you know who to vote for, and it was jaundiced, it, mm. it really was. And I kind of, that's not even impartial, it's kind mm. of, I don't know, and it's not billed as being an opinion piece, this is billed as being, here's an independent guide to who to vote for. Where's, where, where's it going from now? Uh, do any of you think, uh, I think Daniel, your son is in around the same age as my son, and uh, they're relatively new voters, uh, but they would get a lot of the information on everything in their lives from the internet, including politics. It was, it was really interesting um, seeing my, my, my son, you know, he would talk to me, he, we would have a debate, we would have a discussion, we would, you know, kind of talk things out, but then ultimately he took that information and he went away and asked his girlfriend, asked a few other people, and they were all sharing information that they were seeing online, and actually it was that jaundiced piece of content that he showed to me and said, well, this is, this is what I'm being told. Now, thankfully, hopefully we've done a good job in raising a, a relatively aware individual in that he was able to say, this looks coloured, this looks biased to me, you know, and, and he didn't think it, it held mm. water. But he was saying a lot of people his age were making the decision to vote Sinn Féin based on this particular piece of content. I won't deign to call it journalism. Andrew, do you think that campaigns in the future will begin, be fought, won and lost on the internet? I mean, I think you could argue that that's already happened, frankly, and I think it will continue to be important because it is that shop window and it is, um, it is a place where, you know, currently we have our broadcast rules um, for radio stations and, and television. Those rules are not applied in the same way to all outlets on social media and, on, and online. Um, it, as Daniel said, certainly for, for LBC, our, um, our journalistic standards are applied across the board because that's part of gaining that trust with your followers and your listeners on whatever platform they're on. Um, but there's no doubt that there are challenges there because there are plenty of unregulated um, outlets who, who will perhaps have a particularly partial opinion that they want to, to put across. And so it is a little bit still frontier land in, 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 some, in some ways. And I think all you can do as journalists is maintain your integrity and try and be that, that, that voice. And in an era of 
I hate to use the phrase fake news, but it is bandied around by everyone from the US president down, um, then I think all that we can do is try and fight against that, maintain our standards, maintain our integrity, and continue to cut through by presenting facts um, and presenting opinions mm. and allowing people then to make their own minds up. Uh, I think you're right. It is happening already to some degree, but I, I think as we go forward in time, it'll become essential and it really will be the making and breaking of people. Do you think, Mandy, somebody needs to tell the politicians this? What, what amazes me as a, as a sort of an observer of both of these industries, it is that the people who are more concerned about it are the media and the journalists are the ones who are making um, the case and calling people out when things are wrong. And I think that it is you know, quite astonishing that you know, the leader of the most you know, powerful country in the world and, and the likes of Boris Johnson are the people who are almost advocating the demise of the media. I mean, disruption is about two parts. It's about, you know, disrupting society and disrupting the media as we know it. But it is only one part of the equation. It's to build up a society in the likeness that you want then. And so the fact that there aren't more politicians who are concerned about the first stage of this disruption and the, the, the absolute need for an independent media um, is, is just really, really worrying. And that there aren't more politicians calling for education in this sphere because, you know, many of us are old enough to have the impartial views that we have and be able to see the wood from the trees. Others might not be so fortunate. So I would think that there's a huge role for educators as well um, and politicians to work together to do this. But unfortunately, at the moment, it is just that journalistic community who have those standards and say, no, like, like we were talking about the fact check on the social media site, it was the media who actually said, no, this is a step too far. Um, and I think the media, although they're going through a very difficult time of their own in terms of resources and funding and commercial uh, um, difficulties, they're probably going to be the ones who save it as well. And what about regulation in the future? Is it something that the BAI could take control of? I think particularly in this country it's very important because many of those huge platforms are based mm. here. Um, I think, yes, the BAI have done a good job in, in sometimes very difficult cir circumstances, but I think, again, it's about forcing the politicians to do something. I mean, we have every single uh, multinational media platform based mm. in this city. Uh, so if we can't engage with them and start to try and develop things, what chance does anybody else have? Daniel, regulation? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes you feel when you're coming from the traditional media side of things that, you know, you're, you're fighting with one arm tied behind your back. You know, there's, we would have, um, you know, solely digital news platform competitors um, that can say what they want online, do what they want online, etc. Um, and, and again, while our, our website wouldn't be regulated, you know, per se, we would apply the same standards, you know, as, as, as uh, Andrew was saying, in relation to maintaining that trust and, and impartiality. Um, I think commercially, radio stations um, have had a hard time uh, of recent years. And, and kind of, you know, when you look at the knock-on effects of that, that affects and impacts directly on journalistic qualities newsrooms and I, I know there's a few station owners in the room here newsrooms are an expensive thing to have in your business and they, they take an awful lot of money they take an awful lot of resources and when resources are drying up coming into to companies there has to be a, an, an invariable knock-on effect and if as Mandy says the, the, the journalists are going to be the, the torchbearer here going forward to ensure that we do maintain trust and integrity and in how we report on things then there has to be a recognition of the role of, of journalists and the importance that they play in our society, uh, and they have to be resourced correctly. Our own view, um, what we've done is diversified our business. Uh, we've created a business model that um, where we have video income and we, you know, we do stuff uh, on white label for companies, and um, that creates revenue, income for us. 
and then we actually look at the elections rather than as a, a cost and some you know, massive cross that we have to carry for a weekend. We look at it as an opportunity to shine a light on our capabilities. You know what, we can live stream two TV studios, we can have you know, 800,000 plus hits to our website, we mm. can have it's Facebook exciting. Live, etc. <laughs> Very different. If we yeah. can do that for our brand, mm. what can we do for your brand? And, and we've, that's the, the commercial piece that we get out of it, and that allows us resource, you know, what yeah. we've, we've done at election time. Uh, Andrew, in terms of regulation, the experience isn't any different in the UK, is it? No, I, I think you're right. And I think, you know, I, I've been very lucky to have joined LBC, at, you know, when it's got record numbers and it's flying high. But, but you're right to say that, you know, um, in, in other um, outlets and in other stations, then uh, maybe that isn't necessarily the case, but I'm, I'm fortunate to be at one where, where it is. But what, it, what, what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, we would absolutely welcome clarity, certainly from, from a regulator. I mean, it's been, it's, it, there's a suggestion, isn't there, that, that Ofcom will uh, be looking into um, uh, whether or not uh, there should be more regulation online and on social platforms and whether it is the regulatory body to do it. I mean, it's very, very early stages. We're you know, certainly keen to see where they go with that. Um, but as I alluded to earlier on, there are... Um, uh, other uh, media outlets that will be very uh, opinionated, will be very strong and very overt with their, with their views. Um, and I think it would be great to see uh, some kind of parity between those traditional broadcasters that apply the, the, those traditional journalistic views of balance and fairness to all of our platforms and some of those slightly more rogue outlets that, that currently aren't doing so. Yeah, we might uh, look for some questions. Uh, I might actually ask all of you who will make up the next government and, <laughs> and the government after that right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shortly. Uh, but uh, right. has anybody any yeah. questions for yeah. the panel? Um, thank you very much. It was very insightful. Uh, I'm Emer Neve Rainon from KCLR 96 FM, uh, local radio for Carlo Kilkenny. So um, I'm just really interested because we've gone on a similar route with the election coverage and trying to bring our listeners in to watch as well as hear everything. But actually, if you indulge me, my question is for Mandy. I'm just being a nosy journalist now. I was dying to know, um, what did you think about those very cringy Fine Gael videos on social media you know the one with the oh, uh, Michal Martin mass yeah. and the Benny Hill music yeah yeah actually I think it's a classic example of what I was was trying to talk about earlier where politicians <clears throat> and and advisors say you know, we have to be on social media oh what works on social media funny stuff okay let's let's make funny stuff and then they, they, there's a group of 40 year olds making funny stuff that works um, you know, somewhere okay so it worked for a group of 40 somethings who thought this is hilarious everyone would get the Benny Hill thing and it's brilliant and the audience that they were trying to relate to was totally uh, not only shocked it actually proved their own narrative which was you don't understand us um, and, you know, it fed into this notion that you're separate, which is the absolute opposite of what a politician should be trying to do um, on social media. So there is that phrase, there's no such thing as bad publicity, but there really is. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Hi, Willie O'Reilly. Um, a question here for Andrew. Andrew, you spoke about journalistic standards, impartiality and fairness. So how come Nigel Farage has a <laughs> program on your show? And how do you patrol those kind of uh, values within his broadcasts? So, um, look, as you've probably seen, we've got all different kinds of opinions and presenters on our uh, output throughout the day, everybody right across the board. So Nigel's just one of a number of presenters. And if you look across our output right the way across the week, we've got a really good mix and balance. And we choose not to balance within individual hours on individual shows in the way, say, that the BBC might. Um, because if you sort of have a conversation with somebody in a pub um, or, you know, and you're chatting, you wouldn't necessarily clarify every point and try and get all angles on a, you know, into a conversation. You just sort of say what you think and 
Uh, I'd say what I think to you, you'd say what you think back to me. And then you might go and have a conversation with somebody else who gives you a, a different perspective. And that's kind of our, our approach to, uh, to LBC. So Nigel presents his show. Um, plenty of our other presenters would have differing opinions to Nigel. And across our output across the week, then we certainly make sure that we apply those standards, that we do balance. Well, then a quick question. We know that how the BBC is patrolled by Ofcom. Indeed, a former colleague of mine, Kevin Backhurst, is now doing it. So what's your relationship with the regulator? Do you sit down and say, look, Nigel has three hours, they have three hours. That, how does that work? So, I mean, I'm not here to speak about how Global might handle its compliance, but I do know there's, there's a, a significant amount of investment goes into compliance on the radio programmes. But my particular um, aspect of, how, of my, my job at Global is to look at how we promote programmes and interact with people on digital platforms. And so for each of our shows, we'll be looking for that particularly good moment, which we will extract and we'll pop out no, on, no, I get on our different I'm asking platforms. A particular question. Do you sit down with the regulator as LBC each year and review these values? Yeah, well, I mean, that wouldn't be a question that I'd be able to answer. Well, you must know. Does it go on in the country? <laughs> Very political, but thank you. Okay. Are the calls screened for Nigel Farage, Andrew? Are the calls screened? Yes. In, in, in what sense? Uh, uh, I mean, in, every, in, the se every... in the sense that the callers who come on tend not to disagree too often with Nigel. I mean, Nigel is challenged regularly in every show. He wants to be challenged in every show. Um, and actually, it wouldn't be a very good listen if Nigel just had people with the same opinion. Because the whole point of LBC is it's a conversation. Um, so it wouldn't be a conversation if it was all one way. OK, I'm sorry. Hi, um, uh, Mandy, uh, question for you, but indeed I'd love to get the opinion of uh, either of the other panellists on it as well. Um, you spoke of kind of occupying that quite unique position between uh, politicians and journalists and interviewers, and I've always been irked, and I could imagine other people would be as well, when you see sort of a, a very weak interviewer who allows a politician to merely get out their points, and you're, it's almost like you're just watching a speech and the interviewer is just there to um, allow them that excuse, uh, sort of. So if you imagine that on one end of the spectrum, I think the other end of the spectrum would be uh, Andrew Neil's interview with Jeremy Corbyn prior to the UK election. I'd love to get your opinion on that, because when I watched that, I, was, I thought I'd never seen anything like that. So I'd love to get your opinion on it, and indeed the opinion of the other panellists as well. Yeah, well, the first type of interviewer that you spoke of there, I love them. I love those type of interviews. That is, they just, you know, they're, they're the best. But um, I think it's somewhere in between is really what you want because as politicians, you know, it's, it's like promoting a product. You want that interview to be the best. You want it to answer questions as well as, you know, promote yourself because nine times out of 10, the reason that you're putting somebody on a program or in an interview situation is because there's issues there that the public need to hear about and need to have addressed. On the other side, I think with that interview in particular, and I understand it because there was such an emotional debate at the time and there was such emotion um, in the UK about Brexit and people had taken such definitive sides. It was almost as if journalists, and he wasn't the only one, who were taking personal responsibility for, um, you know, I'm going to be the person who exposes you. And that's not right. You know, it doesn't matter whether or not as a journalist you agree or disagree with someone's perspective. Your job, in my view, anyway, is to um, elicit the responses that the, the person can give. In that interview, I felt it was exposing what the a politician didn't know in a very aggressive way or couldn't say or wasn't willing to say. But I think you could look at a series of interviews actually during, during the Brexit uh, debate um, and, and, and the consequential um, election campaign where journalists just became emotionally involved. I think authenticity is is a big part of it, and you know, if I look at Niall Delaney, he's our main morning uh, presenter. He is five days a week, all over the course of the year, listening in our community. He's hearing about what the issues are, etc. So he's well placed to to challenge. He's well placed to, to ask those questions, and um, probably very uniquely qualified. And if he doesn't 
ask those questions, he'll lose credibility. So I think there's there's a balance, and, and I know we kind of referred to it nearly as the game before a little bit, but if there's authenticity and, um, and, and people smell it when it's not authentic, and if you've got a genuine presenter, that is good both for the politician who is challenged and for the authenticity of the presenter. So to me, it's, it's somewhere in the middle is probably the right place to be. Okay, well, unfortunately, your time has run out on us. Uh, it's all about content, and I think you've all given us pause for thought in terms of how we go about uh, approaching how we produce uh, the content, and uh, it was a, a very interesting session, so many thanks to all of the panel. Thank you.